What are the changes that we've seen and the changes that we can expect in Canada um, is a big question. Uh, so I think Canada is absolutely the canary in the coal mine for global warming. Um, we're seeing rates of change which are rapid in the west of Canada. We've seen um, winter minimum temperatures that uh, have increased by five to six degrees C over the last 50 years. And clearly the glaciers um, are facing rapid decline and mostly the Rocky Mountain glaciers would have gone by the end of the century. Um, we're seeing um, changing patterns of hydrology in the prairies. So we're seeing summer rainfall events for the first time exceed winter snow melt in terms of flood risk. Um, and we're seeing uh, increased pressures on water quality as well as quantities. So nutrients are the generic um, problem. And um, uh, Lake Winnipeg has major issues with uh, nutrient pollution from the Red River. Um, had a massive algal bloom in 2007. Um, uh, the Great Lakes in the east, um, Erie managed a nutrient problem, but it's now re-emerged um, because of diffuse pollution. So we're seeing rapid change. Um, these changes are set to increase, um, and certainly we expect increasing intensity of extreme events, and um, floods are very much in the news at the moment, but one of my biggest concerns for Western Canada would be a decadal drought, um, which has certainly happened in the uh, paleo record over the last uh, few hundred years, but not the instrumental record. Um, and then um, the increased temperature um, is going to have um, quite subtle effects. Um, so for example, think about agriculture. Agriculture will be moving north. Um, but there may be some crops that can no longer be grown in the south because of heat stress. Um, one of the things that I've experienced in Saskatoon this winter has been a lot of zero degree um, winter temperature days and, um, and that's a problem. Um, so we have a nice cold winter at minus 20, everything's fine. But uh, if we have this diurnal cycle of um, thaw during the day and freeze at night, um, then that's, uh, that's very problematic for living. And of course, um, zero degree events are associated with things like ice storms and so on. Um, so these will increase. Um, so those are the major challenges. Um, the big issue is um, lack of data, um, large areas uh, with small populations, but also simply monitoring the processes that are so important, like snowfall and snow melt. Um, so uh, we have a very poor understanding of um, precipitation inputs to our hydrological systems. Um, now, there's lots of exciting opportunities to move forward on this, and um, one area is um, uh, high-resolution atmospheric modeling, which will give us, I think, much better insight into current and future precipitation. Um, but then there's some very exciting opportunities in new technologies for observation. So we'll be, we're doing a lot of work with drones. We'll expand that considerably to multi-sensor drones. So for the first time, we can get very detailed information on snowpack properties, um, uh, that depth and thermal properties from, from space, LIDAR from space. Um, we'll be able to measure water levels in lakes and reservoirs from, from LIDAR and from satellites. Um, and then on the ground, new sensors um, for, for, uh, for sensing snow using acoustic methods. And um, we've got some very interesting work going on with um, eDNA techniques, looking at ecosystem health um, by looking at the genetic fingerprinting. And in fact, with, with a single sample of river water, you can detect whether or not an invasive species is present. So that's a hugely important step for protecting Canada's water environment. I arrived in Canada in 2010 with the benefit of a $30 million grant, um, which was partly funded um, by the federal government and the province of Saskatchewan and the University of Saskatchewan under a scheme called Canada Excellence Research Chairs. 19 of us came in from outside Canada at that time. This um, enabled me to realize an ambition. Water is very um, multifaceted. Um, and it involves many disciplines and um, not only does it involve the, the natural sciences with sort of atmospheric sciences and hydrology and 
ecosystem science and so on, but also the social sciences and the health sciences uh, are important. In fact, most of the major challenges in terms of managing water to do with governance and social systems. Um, so I really wanted a vehicle to bring all that together, and so I created the Global Institute. And, um, and in our first seven years, we uh, focused initially on our local playground, the Saskatchewan River Basin. It's about 400,000 square kilometers from the Rocky Mountains drain to, um, to Lake Winnipeg. Um, and then we ran a NSERP funded project called the Changing Coal Regions Network, which allowed us to expand our focus um, geographically to the Mackenzie Basin, so we go from the US border in the south to the Arctic, and then to start to network with scientists from six federal agencies and eight universities. And then that really gave us a springboard for a unique new opportunity, which um, is in its first year. So we, um, we won an award of $78 million from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And that has enabled us to bring together 18 universities across Canada to address some of the challenges of water. And the, we have four partners who are um, the universities of Waterloo, McMaster, Wilfrid Laurier, as well as Saskatchewan. And those partners are all putting in between 10 and $17 million into the program. And that's going to create 20 new faculty positions across Canada. So um, we're really seeing uh, an ability to help develop Canadian expertise and uh, take on a leadership role for Canada in international science. So one of the things that we're keen to do um, is to uh, take a leadership role in international programs. For many years, I was um, chair, a co-chair of uh, uh, GWEX Global Energy and Water Experiment, which is part of the World Climate Research Program. We're also doing a lot of work with, with UNESCO, and we're also part of um, a Future Earth. And one of the things that we're doing is really pioneering the use, the use of large basins as an integrator for large-scale science. Um, so we can not only better understand climate change, the feedbacks from the land surface to climate, but also address at that scale the management challenges that apply to large basins.